Good morning. I'm Constable Tyler Bell, Public Information Officer for Peel Regional Police. Thank you for joining us here today as we deliver a significant investigative update into the large-scale gold theft that occurred at Pearson International Airport last year. This investigation, led by Peel Regional Police, involved both national and international law enforcement agencies. We appreciate the patience on behalf of our community and the media up until today's update. As you'll soon find out, this was an extremely vast and complex investigation, the outcome of which relied heavily on keeping specific details sealed to maintain the integrity of this investigation. Today you'll hear from the following speakers. Peel Regional Police Services Board Chair Nando Yanica, Chief Peel Regional Police Nishan Duryapa, Detective Sergeant Mike Navity, Major Case Manager for this investigative team, Special Agent in Charge Eric J. Degree from the Philadelphia Field Office of the Borough of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, also known as the ATF, Deputy Chief Milinovich of the Investigative and Emergency Services Command for Peel Regional Police, and Mayor of Brampton and Police, Police Services Board Member Patrick Brown. At the conclusion of today's update, there will be an opportunity for questions specific to this investigation. And with that, I will now turn the podium over to Chair Yannick. Well, thank you very much and welcome to Peel, everybody. It really is an honor to be here on behalf of the Police Services Board. I'm Regional Chair Nando Yannicka and Chair of our Police Services Board, and an honor to be here with my dear friend and colleague, Mayor Brown, as well. You know, the, the story in the headlines might read that this is going to be a story about a gold heist. And, and I'd like to take a different tact on it. This is also a story about reverse alchemy. Remember we studied in high school alchemy, taking something inanimate and turning it into gold, that mythological practice? Well, as Patrick Brown will tell you, and as we know on the police board, this isn't just about gold. This is about how gold becomes guns. It isn't about stolen vehicles. Stolen vehicles become guns. And gold can be remade, and gold can be insured, and so can cars, but people's lives and what happens when guns are involved cannot. So that's the first message I want to convey on behalf of our Police Services Board. The next thing I want to say is I've had the privilege of being around for five decades. I was first elected in 1988, and it never fails to amaze me how incredibly good our enforcement service in Peel is in chasing bad guys. We're damn good at it, and we get our man. And when I started, there was the case of Barbara Turnbull. That's a long time ago for those of you that remember it, and we got our man. I don't know how many of you remember the Peter Demeter case. Peter Demeter might have been our O.J. Simpson, except Peter Demeter went to jail because of Peel Regional Police. Muriel Holland, don't know if you remember that one. That one hurt me particularly because she died across the road from where I was born when I was on the board. That was a tough case, and I remember getting updates every year from the service saying, we haven't forgot, we haven't forgot, and years later, with incredible investigative work, we got our man. Lennel Court, when I lived around the corner from there, a remarkable case, and an officer who found a scrap of a receipt in a ditch led to getting our man. And most recently, Chief, you'll remember, and Mayor Brown were telling a story where we got complaints about, why'd you stop all the traffic on Highway 410? Well, there was an investigation, and they had to spend hours with lights at night finding every fragment of evidence. And as it turns out, that last shell casing, from the first one to the second one to the third one to the tenth one to the eleventh one, was the final piece that created the jigsaw puzzle of a fingerprint and we got our man again. And we've done so again today. So much more to follow, but I'm here to tell you that I am so incredibly proud of our investigative team. We're the best of the breast. I'm so proud of our cooperation with our friends from ATF in the United States, because we couldn't have done it without them. And so this is a good news story of these folks behind me who do an amazing job of catching bad guys in Peel. And we're glad to be able to tell you that again today and very, very proud of the people who serve on the Peel Police Services. Thank you very, very much.
Uh, for our next speaker, I'd like to call to the podium Chief of Police Nishan Duryapa. Chief. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, I just do want to acknowledge uh, Peel Regional Police Service Board members, uh, Chair of our board and Chair of the Region Appeal, Nando Unica, who just spoke, and uh, Mayor Patrick Brown, who you will be hearing from as well. Thank you for your endless support of our team. Uh, there's a reason why it's, we picked today for this announcement. Exactly one year ago, 6,600 gold bars weighing over 400 kilograms were stolen from Pearson International Airport here in Mississauga and Peel Region. It had a value of over $20 million, and this particular theft has become the largest gold theft in Canadian history. And it's one of the largest, for that matter, in North America. We here in Peel see a variety of crimes that plague this community. Some are very rudimentary and crude, but this one is a carefully planned and well-organized group of criminals from both inside and outside of airport facilities that orchestrated this theft. Uh, this morning, I'm proud to share an update on this investigation, and it's a real privilege to do that. In response to this crime, we established a project team who I will introduce some of them are behind us. Uh, they are formed, uh, to Chair Nika's point, with some of the finest investigators here at Peel Regional Police. And I need to tell you that it's talented individuals that brought this to the forefront, not myself, not the mayors or chair, but amazing investigators behind us. They spent a significant amount of time to collect, review evidence, and a tre tremendous amount of activity inside and outside this country. As you recall, there has been a lot of silence on our ability to report on this investigation right from April 17th last year. And that was intentional to preserve the integrity of this project. This project was dubbed 24 Carat, and the objective of this project was very simple. And it's what Peel Regional Police is renowned for doing. It's to investigate, identify those responsible, and hold them accountable for crimes that are plaguing our community. I'm successful to say that our team uh, is about to reveal, in a way that we've not done before, nuances of this investigation. This investigation, as Chair Unica mentioned, wasn't just a theft of, of uh, item that had significant value. It has a direct correlation to the compromise of our safety here in Canada and the borders, the integrity of the U.S. And this is an example of how the footprint of things that happen in our community can have rippling effects. We have arrested nine people, issued three Canada-wide arrest warrants, and have laid 19 related charges. And as you will hear, we've interrupted the transportation of a large quantity of firearms intended for import here into Canada. Today we have here with me Deputy Chief Nick Milinovich, who is responsible for regional investigative and emergency services at Peel Regional Police, Inspector Sean Brennan from Financial Crimes, and uh, very pleased to have uh, Detective Sergeant Mike Mavity uh, and the members of, uh, there's 17 of them, of the investigative team uh, behind me in front of the truck that was involved in the theft uh, that are here that are responsible for resolving this. It's also a privilege, as was mentioned, to have the special agent in charge, uh, Mr. Eric Degree from the Philadelphia Field Office of the United States Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives, the ATF. Uh, as you know, this investigation was multi-jurisdictional, which required us to not only work with partners locally, but nationally and internationally. Uh, I would be remiss not to acknowledge uh, Director Jim Walker, who is here with us. Uh, he is uh, in charge of the Criminal Intelligence Service of Ontario. They were a significant component of how this investigation happened, and they are made and allowed to happen because of uh, the Ministry of Solicitor General in, on Ontario. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the Ontario Provincial Police, Halton Regional Police, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and as well the ATF for their support throughout this. Uh, as you recognize, this is and remains an ongoing investigation. You need to know that Peel Regional Police is committed to holding everybody involved responsible for this. 
and ensuring that they are not just identified, but they're charged, arrested, and brought before the courts. We will continue to work with our national and international partners. This story is a sensational one, and one which probably, uh, we jokingly say, belongs in a Netflix series or a, uh, something uh, greater than that. And so you'll see today the opportunity for us to share with you digital media, elements of the investigation, key components that we don't normally do in media and press releases because we do believe it's in the interest of the public given the nature and, and interest regarding this. And so without further ado, I'd like to invite Detective Sergeant Mike Mavity, who was um, the case manager for this investigation, to speak on behalf of his remarkable team. Mike. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. My name is Detective Sergeant Mike Mavity, and I'm the major case manager for Project 24 Carat. On behalf of the primary investigator, Detective Gord Oakes, who's standing to my right, we would like to thank the PRP leadership for their support. And to the 17 members that make up the investigative team of Project 24 Carat, some of which are standing behind me today, through your hard work and dedication, you have made this investigation a success. While the investigation of those responsible for this theft is nearing completion, other aspects are still ongoing. As a result, we may not be able to answer some of your questions about certain aspects of this investigation, as the matter is before the courts. Our investigation involves a stolen quantity of gold and foreign currency that were ordered from a refinery in Zurich, Switzerland. The gold and currency were transported in the hull of an Air Canada flight in an improved airline container destined for Toronto. This flight arrived at Toronto's Pearson International Airport on April 17, 2023 at 3.56 p.m. Shortly after, the gold and currency were offloaded from the aircraft and brought into Air Canada cargo facility. At 6.32 p.m., the suspect arrived at Air Canada cargo driving a five-ton truck. The suspect reversed his vehicle to the loading dock and exited the truck. The suspect was carrying a fraudulent airway bill as he approached the warehouse. The image you see is the actual airway bill that the suspect produced. The airway bill is for a legitimate shipment of seafood that was picked up the day before. This duplicate airway bill was printed off from a printer within Air Canada Cargo. Once inside the warehouse, the suspect provided it to Air Canada Cargo warehouse attendant. A short time later, a forklift arrived with a container of gold and foreign currency and loaded it into the rear of the suspect's truck. The suspect then drives away. At approximately 9.30 p.m. that same evening, Brinks Canada employees attended Air Canada Cargo to pick up the shipment of gold and currency. Air Canada employees tried to locate the container, realized it was missing, and began an internal investigation. At 2.43 a.m. on April 18, 2023, Peel Regional Police were contacted and advised the load of stolen gold and currency uh, sorry, the, the, the load of gold and currency had been stolen. In total, 6,600 gold bars ranging in size and weighing a, a, a total of 400.19 kilograms were stolen. Each gold bar is 99.9% .9 pure and contained individual, individualized serial numbers. The gold was valued at approximately $20 million Canadian based on current market value. The stolen banknotes are in foreign currency in various denominations, amounting to a value of roughly 2.5 million Canadian dollars. Investigators from Project 24 Carat conducted a video canvas going door to door and business to business, reviewing video evidence from surveillance cameras beginning at Air Canada Cargo. Working with community business owners in Peel and Halton region, investigators reviewed their video surveillance and believe the truck took the following route after leaving Air Canada Cargo. Westbound on Britannia Road East. Southbound on Dixie Road. Westbound on Highway 401. We continued to follow the truck and checked each exit that Highway 401 intersects with. Aaron Mills Parkway, Winston Churchill, Trafalgar Road, 
The truck does not exit any of these roadways. This continues into Halton Region as the truck passes James Snow Parkway. And we observe the truck exit at Bronte Road and go northbound on Bronte Road. We continue to follow the truck northbound on Bronte Road. Eventually, as the truck travels north of Milton, it becomes more rural and we lose sight of the truck. This video canvas lasted four weeks with investigators checking over 225 separate businesses and residences in Peel and surrounding areas for video surveillance and then reviewing the surveillance to see if the truck happened to pass. Over the last year, Project 24 Carrot investigators have executed approximately 37 search warrants, 70 production order, and interviewed over 50 individuals. During search warrants, investigators seized the following items. $430,000 in Canadian currency. We believe this money is some of the profits the suspects made when they sold the gold. Six cruelly made gold bracelets that resemble bangles, however they lack various principles typically associated with fine jewelry. These items were sent off for expert examination and are considered to be pure gold. The total value of these six gold bracelets is over $89,000. Smelting pots, casts, and molds. These are commonly used in the industry to change the composition of gold. We believe the items you see here today were used to change the composition of the stolen gold bars to different forms like the bracelets you just saw. Two debt lists, one for 9.943 million and the other for 10.023 million. A common term in drug trafficking investigations, we believe these, licks, these lists actually show where the money was distributed when the gold was sold by the suspects. These lists were found at two separate locations, and you'll notice we blurred out the names. However, they are consistent on each list. We are working hard to identify each of these individuals. Some other items on the list, they have allocated money for trips, supplies, and personal items. The suspect used a five-ton truck to steal the gold and currency from Air Canada Cargo. As the Chief mentioned, that truck is behind me today. Investigators have identified and charged or issued warrants for nine individuals with over 19 charges. Parm Paul Sadu, a 54-year-old man from Brampton and an Air Canada employee. Emmett Jalota a 40-year-old man from Oakville. Ahmad Chaudhry, a 43-year-old man from Georgetown. Ali Raza, a 37-year-old man from Toronto, who also happens to be a jewelry store owner. Prasath Parmalingam, a 35-year-old man from Brampton. These individuals have been released on conditions and will appear at the Ontario Court of Justice in Brampton at a later date. Canada-wide warrants have been issued for the following individuals. Simran Preet Panazar, a 31-year-old man from Brampton and a former Air Canada employee who was employed at the time of the theft. Archit Grover, a 36-year-old man from Brampton. Arsalan Chaudhry, a 42-year-old man from Mississauga. Investigators urge these individuals to seek legal counsel and turn themselves into police. And finally, the driver. A warrant has been, in the first has been issued for Durante King McLean for theft over 5,000 and possession of property obtained by crime. I spoke about the fraudulent airway bill when we were alleging the driver produced. Through forensic examination and through other police techniques, we identified King McLean as a driver early on in the investigation. For the months that followed in the summer, we tried to locate King McLean or his associates. That brought us to September. In September 2023, Durante King McLean was stopped in a rental vehicle by Pennsylvania State Police near Chalmersburg, Pennsylvania. After a brief foot chase, he was detained and troopers located 65 illegal firearms within the vehicle. Since his arrest, Project 24 Carat investigators have been liaising with the, our friends with the ATF. We are alleging that some individuals who participated in this gold theft are also involved in aspects of this firearms trafficking. For further comment on this aspect of this investigation, I will now turn it over to ATF Special Agent Eric Degree. 
Good morning. I'm Eric Degree. I have the privilege of being the special agent in charge of ATF's Philadelphia Field Division. I want to thank you, Chief, uh, and your team for their invitation to speak here today and for the excellent cooperation that enabled the prosecution of these serious crimes. For those of you that are not familiar with ATF, we are one of the United States Department of Justice's law enforcement agencies. We protect our communities from violent criminals, criminal organizations, the illegal use and storage of explosives, acts of arson and bombings, the illegal diversion of alcohol and tobacco products, and in this case, illegal trafficking of firearms. Far from being a victimless crime, firearms trafficking presents a grave threat to public safety. It feeds the crime that plagues too many of our neighborhoods by putting guns in the hands of violent criminals and other prohibited people. Law enforcement cooperation with our U.S. and international partners is key to seeking justice and preventing crimes that extend beyond our borders. This case started last September with a late night traffic stop by the Pennsylvania State Police after a keen trooper noted some minor uh, motor vehicle violations. The driver, Durante King McLean from Ontario, was illegally in the United States and fled on foot when troopers discovered the firearms in his rental car. A court authorized search warrant for the vehicle led to the recovery of those firearms that were allegedly destined to be smuggled into Canada. One of those firearms had an obliterated serial number, 11 of them were stolen, and two of them were converted to fully automatic machine guns under United States federal law. Our partners at the Pennsylvania State Police brought in our ATF Harrisburg office to assist with the investigation into this apparent firearms trafficking operation. King McLean was also listed in law enforcement databases, which alerted us to contact the Peel Regional Police, and thus our cooperation started. Due to the scope of this investigation, the Department of Justice's Office of Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, otherwise known as OCDEF, also assisted with this investigation. OCDEF is a multi-agency, intelligence-driven, anti-crime task force that targets transnational criminal organizations. It also tackles violence due to firearms, human smuggling, racketeering, corruption, fraud, money laundering, and for the first time, in this case, international firearms trafficking. Our teams work closely together, including multiple visits to both Canada and to the United States, to share findings, conduct interviews, and enable us to uncover this criminal network. As a result of our investigation, a United States federal grand jury issued an indictment charging McLean with firearms violations for the 65 weapons that he was caught with. Together with Prazeth Pamerlingan, King McLean was charged with conspiring to illegally traffic these firearms into Canada. Furthermore, Jalissa Edwards and Arshid Grover were also charged for assisting the operation by alerting others to prevent apprehensions and concealing evidence. I'm proud to say that we successfully put this international gun trafficking operation out of business, in this case, keeping 65 firearms off the streets of Canada and preventing them from being used in any number of violent crimes. In closing, we'd like to thank the Peel Regional Police, the Pennsylvania State Police, OCDEF for their collaborative efforts that made this operation a success. We look forward to our continued cooperation with our law enforcement agencies, both domestically and internationally, to ensure the safety and security of our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Special Agent. We'll now turn the podium over to Deputy Chief Nick Milinovich. Deputy. Thank you. And I would like to thank Special Agent in Charge Degree. Good morning. I am Deputy Chief Nick Milinovich, and I am in charge of our Investigative and Emergency Services Command. I'm also responsible for the Central Robbery Unit, who led the investigation into Project 24 Carat. What I'd like to communicate to you today is, is really very simple, and there's two parts to that message. This was the largest gold heist in Canadian history. Purportedly, it's the sixth largest in world crime history. Our ability to be here and promote the results and the outcomes of this successful investigation rests directly with the people that you see behind me here today. 
They are the very best in class in investigative excellence, and they represent what Peel is, which is the gold standard in investigative excellence. So the first part of that message is, I would like to thank them for all their work and commitment to this. The second thing that I would like to talk about is also very simple. Organized crime and criminals who come to our community, target it, or attempt to profit from it, can expect the same outcome. We will pursue them, we will arrest them, and we will charge them. This is more evidence of that. I would like to thank Director Jim Walker from CISO for their co contribution to this investigation. They understood the enormity of this investigation and the extraordinary circumstances that required their support and participation. Once again, I would like to thank all of our law enforcement partners who have assisted us. We appreciate the special agent in charge, as I mentioned, his colleagues from the ATF, and all of our partners locally who helped us bring this investigation to a successful conclusion, or at least arrests. Now I would like to invite Brampton Mayor and Peel Police Service Board member Patrick Brown to share a few words and thoughts. Thank you. Well, thank you, Deputy Chief uh, Milovich. Uh, what a great day for public safety. You know, you tend to turn on the TV and you'll see uh, when a crime is committed. Um, and, it, and it shatters confidence um, in the community when you see um, something like this happen. What we don't see enough of, and I'm so proud that it's being shared today, um, is the incredible investigative work um, of the fact that in Peel Region, we've got the best of the best to make sure that those who commit crimes are apprehended and are arrested. Um, on behalf of my city, I just want to say the debt of gratitude we have for the extraordinary, exceptional police officers we have. You know, in Peel Region, they deal with some of the most uh, difficult criminal cases. You know, this is a region that reflects the whole world, and with that comes some of the world's challenges. Um, whether it is sophisticated international auto theft rings, whether it is extortions, human trafficking, they deal with some difficult issues. I don't think I ever imagined they'd have to deal with the largest gold heist in Canadian history. It's almost out of a, a Ocean's Eleven movie or a, a CSI. Um, but these criminals thought they were more sophisticated than police. They were wrong. They didn't count on Chief Nish, they didn't count on Deputy Chief Milinovich, they didn't count on the incredible work of Inspector Sean Brennan and Detective Mike Matamy and the great collaboration with ATF. This is an example of police work at its best. And as much as I think today is a celebration of those behind it being arrested, um, for me it is another sign of the incredible confidence we should have in policing in Canada and particularly in Peel Region. And so. Um, to Nish, I want to say thank you. I, I, I say this again and again. We've got the best chief in the country. Uh, four years ago, when he started, he made a comment, and he, and he, he, may, he may even forget this, but he said he was going to use technology uh, to solve more investigations. Um, this is an example of just that, using the most sophisticated technology to apprehend those responsible. So thank you to the best of the best in the Peel Police. Today is a tremendous win for public safety, um, and it is, as our deputy chief said, a message to anyone attempting activities like this, anyone attempting to profit from crime and engage in crime in Peel Region, that they will be caught. Um, this is the result. Um, and I have to say, you give the police the resources to do their job, they do it. This is an example of that. So congratulations, a great day here in Peel Region. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Before we begin with questions, I want to reiterate that the manner and timing in which we relay information can have a drastic impact on the outcome of investigations such as these. Aspects of this case, as Detective Sergeant Mavity mentioned, remain part of an active investigation and that there may be certain questions that we're unable to answer today. Uh, this press conference has been live streamed and it will be available for streaming after the fact on our Peel Regional Police YouTube channel. Uh, at the conclusion of this, there will also be a detailed media release with the images you've seen here today, as well as a detailed list of charges. I ask that the questions be limited to one question with one follow-up, and that they remain relevant to today's uh, update. Please provide your name, the name of your publication, and who your question is directed to. 
There's a microphone on either side of the uh, cameras here, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. And with that, I'll uh, now open the floor to questions. Good morning, Sean O'Shea with Global News. Um, I'm wondering if the chief, the deputy chief, or somebody else in the investigation could actually uh, let us know what percentage of the gold was recovered. In terms of exact percentage, I don't have. Uh, during Detective Sergeant Mavity's discussion, he did mention that $90,000 worth of pure gold was recovered. Uh, it was crudely fashioned in the form of bangles. And that sits uh, as what we've recovered thus far. So 90,000 out of the 20 million. That's correct. And then my, my supplementary is with respect to how easy, I mean, with respect to what was described here, it, it, it appeared to be very easy. Can you comment on that, please, the theft? Yeah, the, uh, I think the way that I would characterize it is being very organized and taking advantage of opportunities that were afforded by people by virtue of their employment. Um, I certainly wouldn't say very easy. Uh, because this investigation has been an incredibly comprehensive investigation with tremendous amount of resources devoted to it in order to identify the people responsible. But certainly, the positions of the people that were involved in it made it easier. Thank you. Hello, Miriam Adaya from Radio Canada. Question for Mayor Brown, uh, if possible in French. Um, Qu'est-ce que vous diriez aux uh, suspects qui sont encore en liberté en ce moment? What would you say to uh, suspects that are um, still free right now? Uh, for suspects that are still free, they should come forward to police. They, as was said before, they should consult their lawyer. C'est important de parler à leur avocat et uh, présente aux stations de policiers. Il est les meilleures polices dans, dans le pays ici. Et pour moi, je, ça c'est un autre euh, exemple de la confi confiance que nous avons dans, 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 dans cette équipe. My follow-up, you can, you can stay if you want for the follow-up. Um, Est-ce que vous êtes quand même déçu du fait que seulement 90 000 dollars des 20 millions de dollars ont été euh, récupérés jusqu'à présent? <sighs> Aujourd'hui, la première nouvelle. Uh, que le policier trouve la personne qui um, est uh, uh, responsable pour sa crime. Avec plusieurs de temps, je pense qu'il peut trouver um, uh, plusieurs de l'argent uh, uh, qui, qui, qui est avec ça. Um, so, pour ça, ça c'est la première étape. Je pense qu'il y a plusieurs étapes après ça. Um, mais encore, j'ai la confiance de, dans, dans cette équipe. Je pense qu'il est le meilleur policier dans, dans le pays et il travaille ensemble avec les États-Unis et je pense qu'il va trouver plus que uh, dans, dans les semaines um, uh, après. Uh, Katie Nicholson, CBC News. I'm just wondering, we, we started this press conference talking about the alchemy, reverse alchemy. I wonder if you could expand a little bit on how the gold um, led to the guns and, and that alchemy, but also how long this trafficking ring had been in operation and what the scope of their activities outside of these charges might have been. I'll start just because I used the phrase. Um, it's become very consistent now, especially with regards to the stolen vehicles, that people think it's about vehicles and gold. What we've come to learn from the service over and over is it always comes down to guns and organized crime. So that's what I meant by reverse alchemy. And the chief makes us very aware of that. The deputy Malinovich makes us very aware of that. And it gets lost. It gets lost when we go to the port of Montreal to try and find some cars. We show up on one day and we find 600 stolen cars and we try to explain this is a crisis. And other levels of government and other partners are, well, you know, but we're more concerned about the wrong people getting into the country or we're more concerned about drugs. This isn't cars, this turns into guns and it turns into people who are harmed or killed. So that's where I was coming from, but I think the chief or the deputy can top that up for me, but that's where the phrase comes from and, and my sentiment and my concern comes from. But through to the chief. Yeah, we, you know, to top up the chair's comments, uh, the complexity of what we deal with and quite often things like this might just seem like 
one entity became a victim of the loss of $20 million. For us, it doesn't mean that. Day in and day out, uh, all of our officers are dealing with gun crimes, violent crimes. And so the ability to work things backwards is a very critical uh, element to these investigations. And, um, you know, we can't stress it anymore, even though it does sound very sensational, that those 65 firearms, definitely not in the hands of somebody, save lives, without a doubt. So it's not just the theft of cargo. Uh, this is a dotted line to people's well-being anywhere in, these con in this country, wherever those firearms ended up. Um, as it pertains to the second part to your question, I think probably the best is uh, for clarity on how it practically related to the firearms is to have the, the Sergeant Mavity come up and then maybe uh, uh, the ATF, uh, uh, Mr. Mc, uh, Mc Agree, you would come back and say what the U.S. side looked like for in terms of complexity of the ring. Um, we believe that they've melted down the gold, and then the profits they got from the gold they used to help finance the firearm, obviously purchasing the illegal firearms and that, and provide transportation and accommodation and that to get them up here. So we believe that's how the gold money has has now kind of worked into the firearms trafficking aspect of the investigation. Um, one of ATF's highest investigative priority, uh, priorities is combating firearms trafficking. Um, our involvement in this case started with the vehicle stopped by the Pennsylvania State Police uh, on Mr. McLean um, in discovering those firearms. So, you know, with our uh, crime gun intelligence, we try to find you know the source of those firearms. We're still looking um, at some of the original purchasers. So, that part of the investigation, the actual source of that, is still ongoing. I do have a, um, sorry, sorry, I would just uh, really quickly add some additional information. So, you know, interestingly enough, everybody expects that when you have a criminal organized network, they generally focus or specialize in one area. The reality is that doesn't occur anymore. You know, very similar to uh, private enterprise and legitimate business, they diversify. They look for high reward, low risk. And you know, you've heard that. That's where this group particularly went wrong. They saw an opportunity, theft of gold is committed, and then they used the profits from that to finance other endeavors, to continue to grow the network. Um, and this investigation isn't done. You know, we've recovered a small amount of the total quantity of gold that was taken. We've recovered some of the proceeds. And equally as important, we've also recovered some of the firearms that they purchased as a result of those proceeds in that crime. Uh, so the investigation is going to continue, but the reality is, is organized crime doesn't uh, specialize, other than their specialty is targeting communities and targeting vulnerabilities with an attempt to profit. Thank you. Uh, my follow-up to this is just, uh, I wonder if we can learn a little bit more about the alleged inside man at Air Canada, how long he was employed there, um, and how long he's been unlocatable by police. Well, what was the last part of your question? I couldn't hear it. Uh, just how long he's been unlocatable by police, necessitating the Canada-wide warrant. Um, <laughs> He has been known to us um, since early on in the investigation. Uh, he actually um, led a tour for Peel Regional Police before we knew his involvement. Um, and then he, we knew he was resigning, and he re resigned in the summer of last year. And then uh, we have not been able to locate him since. We, we have an idea, and I can't speak to where we believe he is right now, um, but we have an idea of where he is. But um, yeah, he was... Uh, a manager with Air Canada. I can't speak to how long he had worked at Air Canada. I don't have that information right now. But um, he, he definitely was, um, was a, a manager there. That helps. Good morning. This is Nitin Chopra from Prime Asia TV. Uh, Chief frankly said that this is a movie scene and it must go to the Netflix and we suggest that uh, Peel Police should keep the copyrights before sending to the Netflix. <laughs> and uh, it's very easy nowadays for all these uh, thefts. First thing comes up to our mind is, after all this press conference, investigators work day and night for last one year. After one year, today is 17th of April, these people are being charged. And first, first thing comes to mind, they went 
250 businesses, houses, search operations were on, hard works they had gone through, we know that. Very easy is to release them in a single day. And then uh, Chief said that they are already out on the conditions. We have Chair Nendo here, we have Chief, we have Investigator Officer. Is that right? Such a heinous crime before we have seen extortionists here, we see why they should be released in a single day. Hard work pays when criminals should be behind the bars. What message you want to, a strong message you want to give on this, uh, Chief or Nando, Chair Nando then? Thank you. Thank you, Nin. And uh, li listen, we, the 17 investigators here, they weren't just sitting in an office waiting for this heist to happen. We have a central robbery team and had to pull talented investigators from all across this region to dedicate to this. So the impact and the resources, and I appreciate you highlighting the depth of the investigation, the complexity uh, that brings us to a point where we can charge and arrest somebody. Just, just for context, and not to put it on uh, our uh, American uh, colleagues here, but you know the individual on the US side who's charged is still in custody. Um, so it does frustrate us, without a doubt. Uh, but as you know, you know we're one part of the system. Our, our goal is to ensure that this case uh, withstands probably a very lengthy court process that's uh, yet to begin. And um, you know how individuals are released is a, is a frustration. We have highlighted the fact that there wasn't just a theft; it's a dotted line correlation to public safety being compromised here. And so uh, we really believe that um, you know. The risk that is involved with the substantive offense is far more greater than what sometimes we see individuals uh, being um, with either withheld in court or for bail or release. Um, you know, our next thing is, you know, as long as they comply with conditions, uh, those are the things that are still our responsibility to contribute to. But um, it is a very frustrating thing for our members, no doubt but uh, it is part of the environment here in uh, Canada. Chair Nando, want to add something on this? Thank you very much, and what a great question, and uh, it, it speaks to our frustration. You know, these are the people that investigate crime and lay charges. We're not the judiciary, we're not the federal government, we're not the provincial government. We don't pass the legislation on bail, bail reform, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure it's no surprise, many of you have noticed that when the time comes that a vehicle stolen, for example, like mine was from my driveway as well, it's always very young kids. Because organized crime targets them because they know it's just a young kid that made a dumb mistake, he gets before the justices and they go, it's a young kid that's made a dumb mistake, and so really do we want to get them started in incarceration? So it becomes a revolving door. It sounds like a joke, but my friend in the media has know it's true. There was one instance where, with regards to a carjacking, organized crime, the individual, poor fella, the judge said, okay, we'll put you out on bail. He walked into the courthouse parking lot and stole another car. You can't make this up. So it is incredibly frustrating that the people here are doing all they can to get you to be brought to justice and then it becomes a bit of a revolving door. I'm going to leave it at that because Mayor Brown's been incredible on this file in terms of vigilance to our provincial and federal partners. And Mayor Brown, I want you to top that up as well, if you would, please. Just to say, Nitin, um, you know, the individual in custody in the United States could be looking at up to 35 years. Um, the charges for the offenses in Canada you know, could be up to um, five years. Uh, and so if they were released on bail, that's a separate um, conversation. Um, and obviously the Peel Police and myself have advocated for, for bail reform, uh, for stronger sentences for uh, property crime, um, to have more teeth. Uh, that individuals like this are, are in custody for a very long time because they're a menace to, to our community. Um, but I wouldn't uh, assume if someone's released on bail, awaiting their trial, that means that there's not going to be significant consequences, penal consequences. And I would note sometimes if you're, if you're in custody before trial, you get awarded a dead time. You get awarded two for one. And so by not being in custody before the trial, sometimes it results in a longer sentence. So I say it's not, it's not a simplistic answer, but of course, you know, I think we've all advocated for more significant teeth to sentencing. Okay, this will be the last question. 
Good morning, Courtney Hills with CP24. I had a question about the paperwork that was handed over as part of the, the pickup of the goods. I'm not sure, Chief, if you can speak to this. I thought I heard you say the paperwork was printed off at Air Canada. Um, was this accurate? Was the, the piece of paper real? Was it fake? I'm just wondering how realistic it was when it was presented as part of the pickup. Yeah, thank you. It's, a, it's an actual... Uh, legitimate airway bill is for seafood. It's just a duplicate. So that actual um, airway, uh, sorry, the seafood was picked up the day before and they printed it off within Air Canada Cargo. So it's a completely legitimate um, one. It's just a duplicate of the original one for the airway bill, if that kind of makes sense. So they produced that and then that, and then they had uh, that led to the gold being grabbed at the uh, Air Canada Cargo. Okay, so you have this accurate paperwork and the arrest of two individuals with connections to Air Canada, a former employee and then I believe a current employee, employee is that correct? That's correct. So was this an inside job? Uh, yeah, the, basically because of their position within Air Canada, in my, in my opinion, yeah, they needed people inside Air Canada to facilitate this theft. Okay, I apologize too, uh, Nitz, and I did uh, miss your follow-up question, so we'll, uh, we'll go with that. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, follow-up is uh, uh, about the charges. Uh, we have seen the charges theft over five thousand dollars and other charges. So we want to, if you can explain, we want to understand how it works uh, when it goes in front of the justice of the peace. Uh, are these charges matter? Like uh, these guys must be repeated offenders. Because these kind of thefts is not easily if they are not organized crime, they are not repeated offenders. So, or we could have more harsh charges so that we can have a system like US, like Chief said that uh, the person is in custody in US, why we release them. So, is charges matter or justice of peace matter or what matters? So, Canadians want to listen. We want these criminals to be behind the bars. What can be done aggressively, federally, provincially, and police officers salute to the, our investigators? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the follow-up question. You know, and just for clarity too, the, the individual in the states still in custody is directly related to the firearms offenses. And to your point, uh, some of the individuals here are being charged with the theft o over $5,000 plus possession of property obtained by crime, which are ultimately what is defined in the criminal code here in Canada. And uh, we, uh, as a police uh, jurisdiction, have to work within what's defined in the code. And so over time, we have, uh, as you've seen with other uh, significant issues, inclusive of auto theft and uh, other violent crimes, have advocated for adjustments and changes, particularly as it came to intimate partner and family violence. Uh, we know that there's an opportunity to strengthen the language in the criminal code. Uh, these are things that in policing and then uh, with our support of our elected officials, we particularly here in Peel because we see a high volume that have been out front o over time. Ultimately, as it pertains to this case, uh, and the mayor said it correctly, uh, you know, the bail and the release of an individual is one thing. Having them come before the courts and uh, go through a trial and be sentenced is the second phase, which, um, you know, this team's not done. They've got lots of work, uh, a lot of uh, documentation and evidence to push through. So, um, listen, this is the environment that we operate in here in Canada, and uh, we uh, are confident that we will utilize our, our abilities within the system to its best. So I do see there's still uh, a few reporters with some questions, so we'll, we'll take those in the interest of uh, time. From the Global Mail. Um, it's a question for Detective Mavity. Can you tell me the role that the uh, first Air Canada employee uh, performed for Air Canada? Where he worked? Was it the tarmac or the warehouse? The first Air Canada employee, what did he do there? He worked in the warehouse. Okay. Air Canada cargo. And warehouse. for the ATF, that, what was the uh, traffic violation that um, spurred the uh, stop of McLean's car? I don't have that exact violation in front of me. I know it was for a traffic infraction. Jaden May Lincoln, Global News. Um, wondering the uh, the people that were involved, obviously, in this, um, did they have any criminal history that we know of? Um, uh, 
they weren't, I'm just trying to think of how I can answer this question. Like basically, uh, some of them there, they were known to us, but not, not a lot of them. Uh, that's kind of a blanket answer, unfortunately. Um, I'm not gonna be able to get into specifics of who in that. Uh, some of them were, some of them were not. Okay. Uh, as far as the guns portion of this investigation, we know that, what was it 60, 65 firearms seized? Do we know if any of them were able to bring in guns before that? How many to Canada? Anything that you can speak to in regards to that? We're, we're still looking into that to see if there is any other possible firearms. So right now we're still investigating to see if there's other sources of guns associated with this organization. Mira Medaya, Radio Canada. I also have a question about the driver. Can you walk us um, through how he was intercepted in the United States and if you already knew he was the suspect uh, driver when he was stopped? So yeah, we knew he was the driver um, early in the summer of our gold theft, um, and we tried to locate him locally, uh, doing various police techniques and uh, investigative techniques, uh, or look for associates of his. We could not find him. And then, uh, like the ATF special agent in charge spoke to, uh, he was stopped in a traffic stop through various police databases. Uh, they knew that we were looking for him and contacted us. And he was found in possession of those illegal firearms obtained through the sale of the gold? I won't comment on like the sale of the gold portion, but no, he, was, he was, had 65 firearms in his uh, rental vehicle when he was stopped. Yeah, and I would maybe just add to that, uh, like we mentioned earlier, again, the reality of crime today and the criminal networks that we see is they do not specialize. So you take profits from one criminal venture and then invest them into others. And you know we've had a lot of conversation. One of the reasons why this investigation is so important is not only has it resulted in finding some of the people responsible for this theft, which was an incredibly large theft, but it's prevented firearms from coming into our country 20 years ago. It was rare in policing to find people in custody or in possession of firearms. The reality today is we do see more and more firearms in our community that are imported, illegal firearms in our community that are brought in by illegal means, very much like this scenario here. Raheem Ladani, CTV News. Uh, just a question in terms of the actual money. So we've talked about $20 million was stolen. $90,000 worth of a gold, pure gold bracelet has been recovered, 65 firearms, some cash. Where does the investigation now in terms of the expectation of how much of the outstanding gold, in whatever form it might be in, is actually going to be recovered? Again, like in relation to the outstanding gold, this investigation is, is not complete. Um, the reality is, as we've seen from what we have recovered, it's been transitioned into profit. So now the investigation will move to the proceeds of this crime. And I would maybe invite uh, Detective Sergeant Mavity up to speak a little bit more about that. So gold is uh, fairly unique where there's no DNA in gold. So if you change the, from a, a solid state, you were to melt it down and put it in a different state, uh, it's very, very difficult for us to tell if it's from the, the same one. So we believe the gold has been melted down and reconstituted into local and possibly international markets. Uh, it can be done, unfortunately, fairly easy. And that's what we're trying to find out. And we're trying to obviously look for that and obviously any profits uh, that the suspects made from it. That's another ongoing obviously part of the investigation and just to follow up in terms of the actual truck can someone just walk us through that interception where exactly it was found and was there any incident when it was found uh, that truck was found locally in the region of Peel. Um, through obviously identifying the driver, it made it a bit easier for us to find the truck. Um, and so there was no, no incident with us uh, recovering that. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. We will make our media officers available after the fact to uh, get any questions that we didn't have to, uh, time to answer. Uh, in addition, please uh, send your media inquiries to our office at uh, media.relations.peelpolice. Thank you.
Sorry, I don't mind a, a few extra questions. I see we have somebody waiting, so maybe we'll do that and then continue on. Thank you. Uh, Ernest DeRosa with the Toronto Sun. I'm relaying a question. So how did the inside job work? You mentioned two Air Canada employees and a way bill printed inside Air Canada. Can you expand on what happened here? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear full aspects of that. Can you repeat? Sorry? Just, just repeat your question. I couldn't yes. hear the whole thing. Uh, so I'm relaying a question. So how did the inside job work? You mentioned two Air Canada employees and a way bill printed inside Air Canada. Can you expand on what happened here? Um, not beyond what I've already reported, that being that the fraudulent airway bill was produced by the suspect driver. It was given to the employee at Air Canada Cargo, who retrieved the container of gold and currency and then loaded it into his truck. Uh, everything else, obviously, is uh, the matters before the court, so I can't comment on specifics on that. Thank you, everybody, for coming this uh, morning. Uh, and if there are any more questions, some of the investigators and uh, uh, the team will be able to uh, stick around. Thank you.